I've been at uh, Bramers for about four years now, and we build a pretty diversified product line, anywhere from uh, fertilizer tenders to hog feeders to boat equipment to tire recycling equipment to truck stretches, um, and then kind of anything that kind of seems kind of fun to do at the time. So um, in a nutshell, that's that's kind of me. <laughs> Things that are fun to do at the time. That um, I like that. I'm gonna have to steal that one. So, yeah. so looking at um, your website, and you know, you and I have known each other for a couple decades now. <laughs> um, the when you what Bramer does is there's the agricultural component, but then there's also tire recycling and manufacturing. Can you talk a little bit about those two different industries and and sort of how they came to be? Because it's not very often you see a company doing ag equipment and uh, recycling equipment under the same roof. So can you talk a little bit about the history of uh, Bramer and that? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, back in the 90s, well, I, Bramer's has been around since like the 70s. So this company's been around here. It's uh, second generation, third generation is working here now. Um, um, so they've they started out, you know, doing basic needs for all the farmers and everything you needed and they've just kind of grown and grown and grown and one thing about Bramers is they've always stayed very diversified so if something bad happens in this market they can always switch to this market and vice versa um, so we have a, a pretty full deck of cards when it comes to producing anything and everything but uh, yeah we got into the um, tender industry I think about seven or ten years ago uh, just because uh, we're in Nebraska very big ag based community um saw a need for you know to need some improvement on some of the machines that are out there um kind of came along and it's been going very well since then um if anybody's dealt with uh, uh fertilizer before you know it's a very corrosive material so this is all stainless steel stuff very expensive and so it, we like to kind of make things right the first time and not have to throw stuff away um, on the flip side of things, um, we have the uh, recycling side, and so we can process anything from a lawnmower tire to the largest tires in the world. Uh, so you're talking anywhere from something you can sit on your lap to a 14 foot diameter, 14,000 pound piece of rubber. Um, so that's a that's a very broad product in itself, um, and that's uh, gets sent all over the world. So anywhere there's big mining or just any kind of recycling when it comes to tires, uh, bailing tires, you know, just trying to downsize and find a better use for them. We typically have a machine for that. So a little bit better than just throwing them in a ditch and forgetting about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the government doesn't really care for that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, and I'm glad someone's doing something with them because, you know, the, all the recycling stuff that I used to do was uh, we were doing more of the, the human waste side and we stayed away from the tire stuff because that's a whole process in itself, which is very unique. So uh, it's it's cool to see, you know, other people out there doing those types of things. So the question, one of the questions I have for you is you're a manufacturing engineer. What is manufacturing engineering mean to you? Um, and, and sort of, you know, you and I went to school for that way back in the day. Um, but what does that mean to you? What has it allowed you to do in the, you know, last long period of decades that we've been out in the workforce? Uh, well, to me, it's pretty broad. Um, because I, like I said, I, I've dealt with anywhere from just a simple drafting all the way to, you know, the, the guy that's kind of got the keys to the boat. And... Uh, with me, it's kind of a it's a overall manufacturing type responsibility, if you will. Um, not only build materials, drawings, you know, making sure you've got all the right machines, uh, tolerances set up, inspections, whatnot, ECNs, but it's also helping to build the team uh, that are that's building the product. Um, you got to have kind of I hate to say the the guy that'll kind of take the blame sometimes, but here I am, you know, um, we all got to work together and, um, being, being a manufacturing type engineer, you, 
you kind of have to know all the aspects of everything that goes on, but yet you're not necessarily the expert on everything. So you have to build a team around in the entire plant, really, um, to kind of be able to do your job and do it effectively. Yeah, it's it's not just one person, right? No. <laughs> as as much as certain people like to think it's just one person doing everything, um, there is there is a, a large enormous group that goes into it. Yeah. Uh, so so through the the you know when you and I got out of school and we went out into the world and we had to learn things obviously the hard way. Um, you know what what things stuck with you most, you know, cause you know, a lot of people go to school and they, and they learn things or forget things. Um, and then you get out in the real world and it's like, Oh yeah, that, that had a lot of value. So if you're talking like in the manufacturing realm, you know, like for me, I always say, you know, properties of materials class we had was probably the most beneficial for what I've done in my past, you know, with machining and things like that. What are the things that you took from college that probably helped you the most throughout, you know, your time, working at Bramer, then, you know, you did fire trucks for a while um, in, in through that process. What was the number one thing that you learned? Um, probably the biggest thing that really stuck with me is when we had to make drawings and actually use those drawings to build something. Um, at the time, I that, that was a terrible idea because my, my drawing sucked. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it's actually doing the work and then being on the flip side of it and actually having to use that work. Um, that makes a big difference. Uh, I've, I've learned that, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of sheet metal in my, my career and that is a big thing. You really gotta get the right information out there. Cause you know, I, I've been around where we've had 20 foot breaks to where we've had like here, we've got four different press breaks set up. Um, if you do that wrong, you can create a lot of parts wrong fast. And that's once you bend metal and get it all twisted around, it's, it's just not something you fix. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, the materials and stuff. Yeah. You know, cause I, I've done a lot of structural stuff I've done, you know, machining, uh, we do a lot of machining here. Um, and that does, that does really stick with me and it's kind of in the back of my head, but I think the biggest thing that really is just, you know, the, being from one end to the other and really having to use my own work is a, is a big, big deal actually. Yeah. It makes, especially when you're talking stainless, right? You don't, you, don't, you can't just um, put a hand plasma there on the side and, and cut it to fit. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's not painted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you, you, you were talking a little bit about teams and you were talking a little bit, you know, from Nebraska and we, you know, our last episode, we talked with uh, Scott from Metal Quest and we touched a little bit back then about how employment in Nebraska is like sub 3%. So it's hard to find good people. So, you know, you, you guys are um, up in Lyons, Nebraska, a little Northeast compared to Metal Quest in the middle. So how, how are you guys going around finding the right people to be on those teams? You know, because the quality of product that you make is just as important as anywhere else on the planet. But you, you guys, sort of, sort of in this realm of a lot of agriculture, a lot of of small places. So, how do you find the right people? Do you just hire people and hope they work out, or is there a process that you guys have developed? Like, you know, if if you get to be part of that, you know, who's going to be on your team? What what are you looking for to make a, a good group of people that can design and manufacture products? Um, well, it. Being up in the or kind of the northeast part of the state, you know, there's we don't have a huge population, so we don't have a big pool to choose from. But uh, we kind of, you know, it's kind of a hit or miss. Um, but what we try to do is the, the people we hire, whether they may, we, we try to develop the skills that they have and then put them in the right spot. And you know, sometimes we might hire somebody. You know, I, honestly, when I came here, I was hired in sales. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I ended up moving back over in engineering. Um, so we try to find the, the, the strong points and then build upon that and then kind of kind of move on. So we, we have a process and then we also, you know, hope for the best. I mean, I don't know a better way to say that. Um, uh, but yeah, we it, 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 we're, we're, we're a place that we, we try to we try to build our employees yeah, and then you know just because you know we may not have another guy that applies for a while um 
so you know we try to we try to hold on to, to what we can and, and build and you know if if nothing else kind of put them in a spot you know like i said we're a pretty diversified place so if we can't really mm-hmm. work in this area maybe you can work over in this area maybe you can work in this area so we try to try to find a try to find a fit for everybody get the right people in the boat yeah make sure all we're in the same way that, that's yeah. the important part <laughs> What, um, how did it used to go? We're all in the same boat, people. Wasn't that, um, <laughs> I think that's how, how that uh, story used to go back in the day. Uh, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to it too, besides the inside joke that, um, that we have together. But, you know, I, I think it, it is important because, um, you, you can interview someone and you can have a feeling about them, but then you get them in the door and it's like, yeah, we understand you really wanted to do this, but, you could probably have a better future um, if you were over here doing this component and working in this realm to help us all be better. Uh, And some people don't want to hear that. (laughs) I've been on the receiving end of that a couple of times, but I think it's, I think it's important and it's also very true when you're talking a, a smaller pool of people you can hire from. Right. Yeah. Um, we're, 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 40 to probably 60 miles to the largest population, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an obstacle. I, so I'm looking through the questions here as we go, and there's a lot of people that um, are telling us that they like SolidWorks, which is good. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a few other things where um, people are saying hello. So if anyone does have questions, please type them in the, in the chat um, related to what they're doing. And we'll be happy to ask our manufacturing ex- expert this week. I don't see any coming through yet for you, but with the SolidWorks thing, so you used to teach SolidWorks for a little bit, right? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I did it for a, a couple of years. Um, I worked for a company in here in Nebraska, and I went around and yeah, basically, if we needed it taught, I kind of figured it out and. <laughs> Hopefully did pretty well. I, <laughs> I get asked to come back sometimes, so I always thought that was good. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that leads to my next question I got for you. Um, so in in all the times like you you went around and you helped companies, and you did training, and you did tech support and things like that, you know, what was like the most common thing that you saw get asked or the most common thing that um, was sort of that aha moment for people? Um it kind of depended um you know it was you know why is it so expensive you know you get that question about every every time but uh you know i don't know the stuff i kind of really not have a really good answer but <laughs> uh you know the stuff i always try to kind of give them my perspective on the software and what it is and how it works and uh kind of some of the inside little things that maybe they don't tell you in the book and and people are like oh wow that's really neat i wish i would have known that you know when i first started doing this or you know and then it was just based on my experience you know i've used solidworks since like 99 so i've i've went through the trials and tribulations of you know a lot of a lot of the the good things and the bad um that i went on so you know, I, I tried to give everybody kind of an overall scope of not only what we're learning, but, you know, maybe some inside things. Hey, if you do this a little bit different, you know, you, you might be a little better off. And um, I think people appreciated that more than probably anything, because I was just being honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that part definitely helps. You know, I, I was thinking back when we were getting ready to do this talk today, the very first class I ever taught in SolidWorks Essentials, you were in. Uh, <laughs> in Omaha. Um, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, the most stressful thing I've ever done was the very first Essentials class, and you happened to be in it, which made it even worse. Because <laughs> it was like, oh, there's someone I know that's going to call call me out. So um, that was that was a couple days ago, but um, but I, it did dawn on me this morning when we were getting ready. So. Um, again, we won't give away our ages because we're all, you know, we're all younger in, in our mind than we really are. So yeah, that's just kind the, of an unlisted number. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we'll just put it at decades at this point. So 
We we did have one question come in, uh, and I think it, it may have been just because we started late. But um, it's a the question is what sorts of agricultural machinery do you design? Um, we uh, typically right now, or what we design now is basic, basically uh, fertilizer tenders, and we do some uh, uh, conveyors and some hog equipment. So. It deals mainly with just the uh, fertilizer industry right now. Um, not saying that someday we may branch out onto something else, but we're we got our hands pretty full right now. So that's kind of what we do. So we have you know a number of different sizes of tenders, and basically these are basically what, what the machine is is it hauls the fertilizer from the main producer out to the field, and then you unload that onto the spreader itself. It's mainly like a dry fertilizer where they spread out. So. Um, anywhere from a 16 ton that goes on a straight truck all the way up to a big 32 ton that um, has a 50 foot trailer under it. So, okay. So it's more of the material handling aspect of it. And then you guys do like some conveyors and things like that too to, to fill the, to tend the machines out in the field. Right. You know, yeah. So, you know, if you're, you're dumping out of a, you know, just a belly or a, a like a bin or a holding bin or something like that, we have a conveyor that'll, that'll handle that and uh, what's unique about them is you can drive them around so they have a little powered wheel on them okay uh, so once you unhook it from your your tractor or your pickup you can fire it up and it's all hydraulically driven and you can pull it into place and set it up and the way you go okay okay um there was a question if you guys do oem for like other companies as well or if it's just your own your own individual brand that you do um, we do our own individual brand right now. Um, uh, right now we don't. That I'm, yeah, no, we don't do any OEM work. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to look through a couple more here. Right. Um, again, I think because we started a little bit late, there was a question of which company do you work for. Um, it's Bramer Manufacturing. Yep. Um, and it's Bramer.com, right? Yes. Um, and that'll be, if you look in the SOLIDWORKS Live component here, you'll see a link to the Bramer page um, from the invite that we have. So there's, uh, let me check one more, just to make sure there's no more questions, no more questions here. And then we'll ask, I got another one for you. So when we look at, you know, design, and we look at the manufacturing engineering component, we look at all, how all of this comes together, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've sort of realized over the years is the importance of, you can design anything you want, but then there's the, the reality of how I'm actually going to make it and make it on time and make it on budget, if you will, whatever that budget <laughs> is. Um, and it, and it always seems like there's a lot of those things that happen that sort of get overlooked, which is where like you and myself being manufacturing engineers, that's where we fall, right? So can you explain a little bit about, you know, the years that you've had at building fire trucks to Bramer to working with customers, teaching SolidWorks, like sort of, of how important that whole aspect of now I got to make it is and your experiences with that? Because I think a lot of times it gets lost in, well, we live in a 3D printing world, we'll just print it and we don't have to worry about how anything else fits. But then you get to dry fertilizer where it has to be stainless steel and everything has to fit together, right? You can't have a leaky fertilizer box. <laughs> so right. can, can you talk a little bit about that? Like your experience, what you've seen and why manufacturing engineering is actually uh, an important component of engineering that often doesn't get mentioned? Um, yeah. Um yeah, we're kind of the we're kind of the in between. Um, you know, Bramers is a small company, so we wear a lot of hats here. But you know, when you're uh, you're big companies that are very structured, we're kind of the guys that bring the reality to the the design team, if you will. Um, <laughs> if you uh, you know, like I said, you get 3D models, you can make it do whatever you want. But when you have to put metal on the machine and actually weld it together and assemble it and bolt it, and then even if you think a little further ahead is how do you service it after it's out in the field, um, that's where you kind of need sometimes some outside help um, and kind of have to step away from the computer in the office a little bit. Uh, 
granted, I've, I've been in those shoes or I've designed something that's super cool and it makes perfect sense to me until, you know, somebody looks at the print and they ask you one question and you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so with the, that comes with a lot of experience and um, not always, you know, good experience. You know, you, you, uh, you always have to have your learning situations or your mistakes, you know, but uh, um, that's a huge aspect on any manufacturing is, you know, yeah, we we have a we have a great design, but do we have the tools to build it? Do we can we can we get the material? Can we buy the purchase parts? Can you, you know, and you know you're going to sell this product for a certain amount of money. The company's got to make money. Um, can we build it for, you know, that price to make a margin and make a profit and still stay within the you know uh, the viability of the product out in the real world? Um, yeah, we can make a, a self-driving great car but are you going to spend a million dollars to buy it (laughs) probably not yeah (laughs) Um, well yeah and and so part of my question is is again i was thinking about you and i going to school together and then like you know solidworks and in sort of the path that we've sort of been along throughout these last few decades and i was thinking the other day of like the short stint I had working with you doing fire trucks, and then I, I went and did other things. And then it wasn't until I went to like Benson Machine and it actually started running the laser and doing quoting and estimating and getting to be around the break and work with all those guys every day. It didn't really click for me until I was actually the person doing the programming and making the parts, right? Um, it, which was very different from when you and I were doing the fire trucks together and it was like, well, we just put a hand plasma at every station. If it doesn't fit, we just cut it to fit. We, who cares what the print says? Like, we'll just, you, you engineer people are just a waste of my time. We'll just build it however. If no two trucks turn out the same, eh, whatever. Yeah. You know, so I, for me, it was like that, that quick aha moment of why manufacturing engineering was important was really the moment where I actually had to program it, then have it bent, then do the inspection while doing the costing and estimation, I was like, oh, this is really important. Um, now I understand why when we were in college, they kept telling us we were doing important work. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so I'm always just curious on other people's take on that. Cause you know, a lot of times when you're you're young, you get out in the world, you, you don't really fully understand how the world works. So I'm always curious of what other people's perspectives are in that. Um, I've, I've got the, I got experience with the, the business side of things quite a bit. And yeah, that's where we start actually seeing the real money and what things cost and the times. And you're just like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, that's it's where it like really just, slaps you in the face. <laughs> yeah. Just randomly throwing 30% on top of what you think it's going to take. 30% isn't that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah, we made a set of doors wrong. Yeah, let's remake them. What's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> There's more steel on the rack. Who cares, you know? Um, it, it was funny. I, I bought some two-by-two two tubing this last week for a project, and in one week it went up four bucks a stick. And I was like, whew, that's quite a bit when you're ordering the amount of tubing that I ordered because it's like that now just four bucks a stick blew my estimate out by quite a bit. You know, and, and, and when you're competing with a lot of other people doing manufacturing, like that four bucks is unexpected. So you really now have to think, okay, well, how can I make it quicker, faster? How can I make sure that I'm still in the range that I thought I was in? Because ordering steel is out of my control, right? So, um, but I, I do have a good question here that just came in. Um, and that is, is it mentally stressful while working on deadlines? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All this gray hair didn't come from age. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, only being 16 years old, I kind of aged a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of you know, the, and like you just said, with the materials and stuff like that, we, um, it's 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 really hard right now. Uh, is we do our best to set up a production schedule and kind of make a flow going through the plant. But, you know, there's sometimes we just can't get parts. We can't get materials or they say, oh, yeah, it'll be there. And then the day shows up and the day goes past and we got nothing. So um, our deadlines right now, especially now, um, are ever changing and ever moving. And 
Yeah, it, um, dealing with that can be just a little bit on the on the stressful side. Um, so you know, having a having a way to kind of shut that off is <laughs> kind of important, especially you know, and regularly it, it is because you're usually you know, especially when you get to the manufacturing and engineering side of things, uh, you know, the design took, you know, twice as long as it should, and then the production end date never changed. So yeah. now you're trying to do everything, you know, with about a quarter of the time you should actually have. So you're kind of making do with what you got. And now when you set something up like that and all of a sudden, well, we don't have material. So well, go to the next one. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really difficult, um, but you know, we're moving around and, um, since I'm kind of the, the designer and the manufacturing guy, I can only blame myself. So I just have to, uh, you know, work ahead near the other areas so that I can have something to finagle in, in the other ones. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. the, it's really challenging to be the in-between person, right? <laughs> um, you know, you wear both hats, but for, there's still that, even wearing both hats, there's still that switch right? Where it's like, oh yeah, design it, make it perfect. This has to go out. We have to make sure the warranties are going to be low. Like it has to be sound from a design standpoint. And then there's like, okay, that's done. Now just cram it out the door. And oh, by the way, make sure that all the quality and everything else that the designer got time to think about, you guys all have to put in too, but you don't have the time to really think about it. Just do it. Oh. Um, and, and yeah. And then when there's a mistake, <laughs> oh. well yeah i mean some people make mistakes right but you know well, yeah, obviously yeah, the designers make a mistake but um you know but uh yeah or something gets built wrong or oh yeah, yeah. there's there's always the you can throw the human factor in there and it makes for an interesting day some days yeah. <laughs> well and, and some of what doesn't get talked about a lot um that i've found over the years uh, especially like when i had to to run the day-to-day -day operations of different companies is there's a certain amount of trust that for a company to be successful, there's a certain amount of trust that has to happen between design and manufacturing to be able to successfully get a product out the door and maintain a level of quality. And it seems like in some companies that I've been around, that trust doesn't exist. And that's what eats up all of the, the time that's needed to be successful. You know, like the designer can't just throw it over the wall and say, well, you guys deal with it, not my problem. Because then the manufacturers are like, well, I don't trust that guy. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And then everything changes, right? So there's a certain amount of what I call selling that has to be done to make sure the people on the floor are trusting in what you've designed to build the quality product that's what's best for the company outside of the egos of every individual person building it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Welcome, welcome to manufacturing. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's part of it, right? So like you have these deadlines, you have these tight times, but you still have to go out and spend time with people and you have to really have them buy into what they're building. Yeah. It's not good enough just to throw it on a piece of paper and a drawing and then be like, well, good luck. I'm going to go home. See you guys on Sunday. You know, <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy the next 60 hours of work that you're going to do. Yeah. That when it's 90 degrees and 80 percent humidity yeah yeah um, yeah it, that 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 mutual respect type there that that's got a that takes some time to build and you you have to have that um yeah you, you can't run out there and just give them a bunch of garbage and say hey make make this look good um and you know you have to own up to what you what you do what you've done what you haven't done and then you know the same as comes from them so you know, it, it's a it's a big give and take, and you got to work together because once you once you build that that teamwork there, you know, even if you do make a little bit of a oversight or something like that, they're going to kind of either make it go away or help you out or say, well, you screwed this up, but I went ahead and fixed it anyway. You know, so yeah. like, you got to remember to go on that backside and make sure it's fixed because if they keep doing that, then they just like like you said, well, this guy's going to screw it up, so I'm just going to do it this way anyway. So. That makes a uh, that makes making changes and things up to date really difficult when that situation you know, goes rampant. Yeah, well, and there's and for, it, as cool as drawings are, drawings are impersonal, right? And yes. they're they're off they're also often left to interpretation. And so by having that human connection that's tied to it, you have the ability to where if someone does have a question, they're like, well, 
I, I know this person, we've had lots of talks about this. I can, I can look at this drawing and I can understand what they want it to have versus being like, oh, I'm gonna post this on Facebook. Look what this idiot <laughs> engineer put in here for this call out. This is the dumbest thing ever. Like, <laughs> whenever I see those posted on Facebook, I'm like, obviously that is a toxic workplace yeah. where someone feels the need to call someone out on social media versus being like, hey, that guy's human just like I am. That person is human just like I am. We can all work together to make it versus, oh, look at this idiot. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I think that that's oftentimes those things get that gets missed. And then when you talk about collaboration and communication, we're sort of talking about that old school, hey, I know you're, you're good at what you're doing. I'm good at what I'm doing. But together, we can be the best for everyone. Um, right. So I'm looking through questions here. And there is a question here, what sorts of fabrication processes do you design for? So at, at um, Framer, which, which fabrication processes are you often designing for? Um, we have a few of them. So we run a plasma, we run a laser, um, we have multiple press breaks. Um, we have a CNC mill. Um, of course, we have a lathe and just an overhead mill and stuff like that. So depending on the product, really, um, kind of depends on the, the fabrication side of it and what we what we design for. So when you're talking the ag side and you know, the stainless steel and stuff like that, we're probably not as tight as far as tolerances and stuff like that as we are on the big uh, on the tire recycling with the big cutters and stuff like that, because um, our cutters are basically like giant scissors. So if your tolerances are off, uh, they don't work real well. So um, we kind of have both aspects of it to where, you know, we sometimes you can have kind of a loosey goosey hole and it's okay just so it goes together. And then we got the other side where you got to be, you know, within, you know, five thousandths. And if it ain't right, you, know, you got you to gotta mess. Because um, a lot of the stuff, of course, that's tight, that's always big, heavy um, material. And if if you go out there and say, hey, guys, I kind of messed up, you really get that whole death look. <laughs> they got to take everything <laughs> back apart. And that's where you stand out there and kind of help. <laughs> you don't just put 406 just get holes? Away as fast as you can. <laughs> it's not just 406 holes for every 3 8 bolt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of them are threaded, you know. <laughs> Oh, you just use that cool feature where it just takes the threads out and then you send it out there and then they get to put helicoils in it. It's really, it's <laughs> an easy solution. Nobody ever gets upset at helicoils. Yeah. Well, especially uh, if you just, you know, with sheet metal, you get it started and you just use your impact, it'll go in, you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> cross thread is, is just as good as Loctite. <laughs> yep. uh, <laughs> so there's a, there's a question that came in here. Uh, I'm gonna change the question just a little bit, but <clears throat> since we've been around the block a few times um what would you suggest for graduates looking to get into this field you know using cad being manufacturing design engineers with all your experience and in you know looking back on things what's your biggest suggestion if there someone wants to get into this this space um that's a pretty good question uh my my biggest thing is probably the hands-on experience um, on the on the on the fabrication side, um, knowing how two pieces come together, how when you put slots in, when you don't, you know, why do you need a slip fit versus a press fit, stuff like that, um, on on the manufacturing side of it. I mean, you can you can read that in a book, <laughs> but um, you know, really going out there and understanding why. That is probably the biggest thing, especially in the manufacturing world, uh, because once you get that understanding, and man, designing around it is piece cake. Um, you know, you can you can learn the CAD tools. Uh, a lot of the CAD tools are really neat, so they're kind of fun just to do. Um, but uh, that that would be probably my biggest thing. You know, if you if you really want to get into sheet metal, or if you have you know if you're in a company that does sheet metal, you know, go out there and hang out with the guys and find out why. Why things are the way they are you know why do they need backstops set like that you know even learn how the you know, different press brakes act differently so you know you could have a, you can have a press brake you can have a pan brake you can you know just have a forming die you know whatever um just kind of go out there and just 
BS with the guys. I mean, it's not always, you don't do it all the time, obviously, but um, trying to, trying to get that knowledge is probably paramount to a lot of the stuff that at least I've dealt with over the years. Yeah, I'd agree with that. When I was running the recycling place, I'd have my engineers go out and help. Uh, not every Friday afternoon, but you know, a couple times a month, they would go out and they would actually help fit what they designed. Right? They would help the welders mock up and fit things. They would they would go over and help move stuff from the press break because even if you're just doing the material handling component of it, the next time you design those parts, you're going to think about how much labor it takes for that guy to move from point A to point B or to bend a 10 foot long piece of steel. You're going to understand that like that's going to take some rigging. That's going to take an overhead crane. Those things take time and all of that stuff is time well spent to understand because, you know, I still have the machinery's handbook that we got when we were in college. And it was cool to have back in the day. It helped me pass tests, great. But it wasn't until I actually got out in the real world that I was like, oh, now I understand why that chart. <laughs> like, you know, before I was like, oh, this is a chart. This is a way to pass a test. So move on, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so if, if you got a little bit of time, Jason, we're going to go a little bit longer today than normal since we started a little bit later. Is that okay yep. with you? Yep, that's fine. Okay. So I got a question for you. Um, this this person says, I work for a smaller company. Do you enjoy having access to the workshop floor or do you think it matters? I, I think that's a really big thing that you should have um, in, in my position anyway. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy going out on the floor and talking with the guys and even, you know, I don't get my hands dirty that often. Of course, I, I hear about it every time I do, um, about everybody will walk by and say something, but <laughs> Um, owners included, <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm kind of hard to miss. I'm kind of a big guy, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that's really important to go out there and just, you know, work with the guys, understand what they're doing and kind of see their, their point of view and their aspects on things. And, um, just even little things, you know, cause every company has, you know, those old machines that only work a certain way because only one guy can run it type stuff. So if you're not out there kind of looking at that and understanding that when you go to make something, not all the time, can you make a part and well, that's one drawing, it's always going to work. Um, sometimes you have to kind of massage things just a little bit and it's either in that part or maybe down the road in an assembly or something like that. So that, you know, you always got to tend to, figure well maybe he's sick or he's having an off day or something like that um i have worked at places where you know we had one guy that could run a, a pan break i mean he's really really good at it but when he was gone oh man <laughs> um so you always had to kind of be aware of stuff like that and you know when when that happened you had to kind of go down and work with the people running that pan break and say okay this is the end result we need he may not be able to get there here so how can we you know make this so that our the, the sky doesn't start on fire and everybody starts running around so yeah. I, i've never the some of the companies i worked for that put up the walls i've never understood that because you work as one company and one team to make one profit for everyone why would you segment the groups to yeah. not communicate better yeah, it, it, it makes things hard yeah i've never understood that like all you all you're doing is creating these little fiefdoms that then everyone gets to control and then the people at the top all have their own agendas because it's generally male dominated so there's an enormous amount of egos um <laughs> and you know like it just it goes against everything a company is built to do i've never ever understood that because you want the people designing stuff to understand how the shop builds it and, and it's amazing how many companies have the one guy that runs that one thing that yeah. they they never think, well, boy, what if that guy gets hit by a bus? That could like really wreck our entire year, <laughs> you know? Um, it, it, it's insane to me. But anyway, I, I have another question for you. <clears throat> and this one's sort of in the vein of what we asked before. So it you can say, well, it's just sort of what I said before if you want. Um, but it... It's what are the skill sets most in demand that you think a fresh graduate lacks or that needs attention? <clears throat> so what aren't they learning in school that um, is in most demand today? Yeah, it, it, it kind of it does kind of revert back to what I said. Um, it's just the actual 
application of what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I think we spend a lot of time in classrooms now, and we learn and that I, I can't take anything away from the very smart people. And from my experience, guys I work for, they are they're sharp. They know their stuff. But when it comes to applying that and actually relaying that information to the guys that need to actually build it, um, that's a that's a big struggling point. And a lot of the the young younger, God, I hate to say young, younger generation, but a lot of the younger guys come stretch, fresh out of school. That it, it's like a missing point, and that's one place where we have to spend a lot of extra time. You know, it, yeah, they can draw it up really fast and do a lot of cool stuff and do all the calculations, you know, and everything, but trying to get relay that information to the guy running the drill press or welding it together that's where we kind of hit a stumbling block so yes yeah. yeah i when i used to hire people my thing was like give me someone with the will to want to learn and grow and i will take them any day of the week over someone that has a perfect looking resume um because if if i go to interview interview you and you're like Oh yeah, I, I, as an example, I know everything there is to know about SolidWorks and I know the best way to do stuff. And it's like, okay, well, would you be willing to learn a new process? Oh no, no, no. I know everything how to do it. I know exactly what the essentials book says. That's how we're going to do it. And I'm like, sorry, buddy, you don't fit what I'm looking for. I take a, a person that's like, yeah, I've used all these other tools, but I'll learn anything you want me to learn. And I will do anything you want me to do because I want to do what's best for my family and the company. I will take that person hands down any day of the week because they are there for the pure love of learning, which means that we all get to go together on the same journey versus, oh, yeah, I've learned everything. I went to school. I did my thing. I've checked all these boxes. I'm just now going to be here, you know, 40 hour work week. I, I think that some of that stuff gets missed these days because there's an assumption of, well, once I get these certifications and I master this, then I'm done. You don't, have, you don't have to tell me anything. I know everything. And, and I think that that gets missed. And I also, personally, I also feel the world needs more people having hobbies of actually creating something, whatever that is, just create. Yeah. Kind of, um, kind of step into that uncomfortable area that, uh, that, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've taken on some things in the last few years that I, you know, five years ago, I would never would even have thought of. And it's actually kind of fun. You know, uh, you know, it's, I'm always, you know, I, I've done, I've done certain things. I've ran solid works. I've done a lot of stuff for a lot of years, but I can't really say that I'm, I know everything about it. Um, every time I talk to somebody or go visit somewhere or see something, I'm just like, wow, that's yeah. either a really cool way to do that. Or wow, that, that's probably not a real cool way to do that. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's always it's uh, I'm always looking for you know a different way and a new way to do things because you know I like I like to do cool things. I, it's just kind of the way I am. I, and if you know if, if there's a better you know a better wheel out there, heck, let's let's give it a try. You know, even if I have tried it before in the past and it didn't work, maybe maybe I missed something in the process. You know, so yeah. it's always a uh, it's always fun to kind of go down the, that old road again, see what you can come up with. Yeah, I, I I learn something new every day, almost. Um, if I don't, then I feel personally, I feel like it's a bad day because I don't know I don't know everything. I don't know how the world works. I have one way to look at it, and if I can learn from other people to look at it from different angles, then there may be something in there that allows me to be better. Um, you know, I I can tell you there were some things that we were doing with recycling with a small group that we were able to be more efficient than a team of thirty, and after that company got bought out. Um, they were like, we don't understand how you were doing this. Because we, we only learned how to do it this way. And like, you have this whole thing and it's like, well, you change three dimensions and the whole conveyor updates, um, no drive works, nothing else. It was just all pure logic based on, you know, ship building, automotive building, like all these things I've gathered from all these people over the years. Like we put it into conveyors and like three guys could go, you know, kick butt and take names over a company that had 30 engineers, just because of the fact we were using the tool as a tool, not the way we were taught. <clears throat> so um, I, I love when someone says you can't do something. Uh, to me, that's the most <laughs> challenge there is. Um, but that's a lot of fuel <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've, I've made a pretty good living off of you can't do stuff. So um, <laughs> anyway, the, there is a question that came in, and I, I don't know, it, you can answer this one uh, however you want. Um, 
what is the best way to manage shop floor operations among big teams? So like your shop floor operations at Bramer, how, how are you guys handling the day? Like, you know, scheduling and, and shipping and that kind of stuff. Like, how do you, how do you sort of keep all the people rowing in the same direction on the boat? Uh, well, we're nice. Like, we're a pretty small company and we're family owned, which is nothing wrong with that. So, you know, we, we don't have, we don't have a lot of the big tools like you would have, you know, we have the ERP systems and the uh, PDM systems and stuff like that you'd have in a bigger. So it's a lot of, uh, you know, we have multiple schedules, which, you know, my, my realm of thinking that's horrible, but it works. You know, um, I like to have one schedule, you know, you, you, I heard a quote quite a while ago, it was one throat to choke, you know, <laughs> <laughs> A good way to do things but you know it doesn't always work out that way and so what we do is we kind of as a as a leadership group we get together uh, like once a week and then we decide hey this is this is what we want to get done this is these are our, our problems this is where our issues are and then we go out to our separate teams and then we um basically get everybody moving in that direction um and so it's it's a very hands-on type set up um but it does work um as long as everybody does their part um but uh you know we you know it, it would be nice to have one big master schedule on a big screen out on the floor and says this department's doing this this is doing this and here's, here's your gantt chart or whatever you want to see and here's where everything's at and where it should be and if it's not there why but um you know like i said we're just not big enough to do that um to you know to really spend the money and capital and hire the people just to run a schedule. So we, we kind of take it upon ourselves, our different division managers and stuff like that. And we just work together and make it work. Which, which I also think, um, I think that's a good thing. And I think it also, one of the things that often gets overlooked is um, where you're at in the world, the communication on how you handle things varies. Um, cause you know, being a Nebraska kid <laughs> growing up, working in Nebraska manufacturing before I went to Kansas and then out to here, I can tell you that the different areas, even though those are only seven or 800 miles apart is very, very different on how you handle and work with people. And it's not one size fits all. And I think sometimes that gets overlooked. Um, you know, so what you guys are doing, uh, works really well for, that type of environment, right? Um, because of how people interact with one another versus out here in Colorado, I can tell you firsthand that managing people is a little bit different. And it's it's sort of, it just depends. I don't know how to explain it other than people are different in different geographies. So handling, scheduling and communicating and things like that are very, very different because um, for example, you live in Colorado tourist state, the focus is a little more quality of life. Um, and so you have to relate to those things and based of, of a quality of life thing um, versus, you know, myself as a Nebraska farm kid, we, we just get up and work. That's what we do, right? That's what you've done, Jason. That's what we've, that we just get up and work. And so our goal is how we communicate is based around a goal to work. Um, so I, I love what you said there. I just want to clarify for everybody that like it is very geographical on how you can handle teams and work with teams because I didn't realize that until I came out here. And I can tell you the Nebraska farm boy work ethic thing does not translate well to people here. <laughs> <That's an example. laughs> uh, I crashed and burned very, very hard in the beginning out here because of um, So I, I do have another question for you. <clears throat> Um, and it, we're getting close here to the end. So if anybody has other questions, please, please drop them in. But um, what other software do you guys use? Uh, and then there's a question, can I ask that on SolidWorks Live? Of course, uh, you know, we're here to talk about manufacturing in general. We, it's not, we're not here to sell products. Obviously use SolidWorks. But um, so if you want to talk about some of the other software you guys have uh, that you guys are using to be successful. Um, yeah, we use, um... You know, we use SolidWorks as our it's our main design tool, but um, we also use Fusion 360 for some of our CNC stuff. We use uh, you know, obviously some nesting software, ProNest, Lantec. Um, we also we have a, a 2D program uh, called Vellum that gets used. Um, 
I'm, I, I gave up on the 2D world a long time ago uh, with AutoCAD. So I'm, if, if at all possible, it, it goes into SolidWorks or something three-dimensional so I can still wrap my head around it. You know, projecting stuff in my head is getting just harder and harder every day. You, know, you got to print the drawing out and kind of bend it around so you can see what the projections are. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I do my best to, you know, I, I'm not a big, super big fan of having multiple CADs packages. But like I said, we only have a few people that run stuff. So if that makes them you know, uh, better for the company. We kind of do that. Um, and, you know, sometimes just the cost benefit of it is just easier. <laughs> yeah. But you, you guys have land tech through Bill, right? Excuse me? You guys have land tech through Bill? I believe so. That's that's yeah. we do all our nesting for our laser on. Yep. Yeah, so I, I used to work with Bill on land tech back in the day. Um, th that's good stuff. Uh, with the connection from SolidWorks, where you can just drop it out and it creates it and flattens it and does all the nesting, like, that, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, um, we, we don't quite have that. Um, just for the, our, our PLAS uses our ProNest and our laser uses the Lantech side. I don't really think we have the add-ins for it. I'm, I'm working on stuff like that. Like I said, I've only been here almost four years, but um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're trying to, I'm trying to make everybody's life a little easier before I start really staring at mine. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge guy on, uh, automation uh, as far as you know data collaboration and you know we we don't we have very very minimal like drawings out on the floor because you know the worst thing you can have with a drawing is a copy machine and um so we do we do a lot of pdfs we have ipads and stuff like that so i mean it's um i'm trying to get trying to get everything as you know quick and easy as possible so i'm not out changing books and doing all that stuff but uh, you know sometimes you just can't help it <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing more fun than pulling up an old revision of a piece of paper laying out there that someone's building to. Yeah, you usually find those right after it's welded or painted. So, yep. Um, <laughs> yep. Of course. It's really hard to blame the guys when they're using the information you gave them. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Your name right down there in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we'll do one or two more questions here, and then uh, we'll let you go because I appreciate you sticking on longer today. From. Um, this one is, is a, I think, is a good question, and, and it's legit. Um, how do you manage sifting through CAD data to find what you need? I've noticed that when you have multiple engineers working, creating files, naming conventions may not be similar, and it kind of creeps up on you. So I know from our past, this has been an issue. So can you talk about how you handle naming and getting everybody to stop using part one, part two, part three? <laughs> Well, uh, I'd like to say I have a, a great system and everything works perfect, but uh, um, what we what we do here is we have a, uh, a basic system that auto generates numbers for us. And then you use that system to kind of give your descriptions and stuff like that. Um, but we do use SOLIDWORKS and parametrics and stuff like that. So just form a habit um, since we don't have a PDM system or anything like that. I go to the top assembly, open it up and dig through it. Um, previous lives of mine, um, you know, we did have a PDM system and that makes life a whole lot nicer because then you can interlink everything and do kind of where used and do different searches and descriptions and whatnot. But, uh, um, and then, you know, that leads into, you know, actually teaching people up to make the parts similar and, doing your descriptions the same and all that fun jazz um yeah luckily here we don't have a we don't have a ton of people doing stuff um and i handle a, a large chunk of what goes out on the production floor so it's not too bad but i can imagine the other guys that have to look at stuff or look for stuff when i'm gone probably isn't great because i just have the tribal knowledge and it's in my head and i kind of have an idea where it's at <laughs> so we don't have a great solution here but um I, I, that's one of those things I work on every day, um, just trying to get file structures and uh, because basically what we have, we have a dumb number that is our file name. And so unless you kind of have an idea what that is, um, uh, it, it can be difficult, but I usually, it doesn't take me too long. I can usually figure out what it is, but I know the guys, when I'm, when I'm gone, I, I get a lot of, a lot of messages saying, Hey, where's this at? What's it called? Where's, you know, and yeah. I'm like, crap <laughs> well there's there's a stat that i saw 
uh, it's several years ago now, but it was like 30% of an engineer's time is spent trying to find files, um, oh, you know, which was cool. the value. <laughs> of the and, um, you know, it gets worse when you wear multiple hats, right? Because now you're not just doing the design part, you're doing the design and all the package that goes together for manufacturing. And, you know, that... <laughs> That leads to you being gone and still getting text messages, yeah. which yeah, also comes gone. back. To, <laughs> which comes back to the how do you break away from your day job? Well, you probably don't that much. <laughs> um, you just develop a night job that's similar and it doesn't really bother you. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I was looking through the last couple of questions. I I think we're we're at the end here. So. Um, I, I really appreciate you being on, Jason. I apologize to everyone for the, the technical issues again. I don't know what the 4th of July did yesterday with the connection that we had, but um, apparently it wanted to take a little extra time off. But um, if, Jason, how can people find uh, Bramer? How, how can they learn more about what you guys do? I know you guys are always hiring people if someone wants to come to Lyons, Nebraska and work. How can they figure out where where the where in the world you're at? Um, yeah, uh, Bramer.com is is our main website, and then uh, our recycling site is uh, EagleInternational.com. Um, that shows all our big recycling equipment. But yeah, you know we're we're kind of the biggest player in Lions. Um, so if you do come into town, we're you know right on the edge of town. You'll see Bramer Manufacturing. So um, we're not super hard to find. Um, but yeah, we, we're always, we're always looking for people anywhere from, you know, welders to assemblers to, to engineering folk, salespeople, you name it. Um, and you know, if we, if you, if you fit in the team, then great. And we just kind of move forward and everybody, everybody builds off of that. Well, and, and you, you have to add in the most important part, Jason, some of the longest life expectancies in the United States is in Nebraska. So if, if you want to be hot in the summer, cold in the winter, get all the seasons and live the longest and, and really good people, Lions is a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's you got that right. It, you, know, you, can, you can have all four seasons in a matter of weeks. So, you know, yeah. it, can, it can be deathly hot and have snow on the ground in a couple of days pretty easily. And and yeah, it's, you know, you always ask yourself, why do we still live here? But, you know. <laughs> it, it's the people man it's a good work ethic and great oh, people so um anyway with that thanks for being on i, I really appreciate it uh, if anyone does have any questions or follow-up stuff uh please feel free to hit me up i can pass them along to jason and um you know we'll connect you with whoever we need to but thanks again